and everybody for another episode of Dr. Jill Live. As you know, you can find all of our episodes on YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, anywhere you watch podcast or listen. And if you're a listener or frequent uh, flyer here, please do stop by and leave your review um, because it does help us to reach more people and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. I'm super excited to introduce my guest today, and I'll tell you just a quick backstory, then I'll formally introduce him. We were just talking about the biohacking conference, which is where we met last year at Dave's VIP dinner, Um, and it's so fun because I'm actually, people think I'm this massive extrovert, and I can like be on the stage and shine and all that, but when I get like small talk in these groups, I'm always kind of an introvert, and it was just fun because I met you and another colleague that does some amazing work, and both those relationships have just been really, really neat connections, and I just remember like feeling immediately um, comfortable. You, you were so easy to talk to. We had a lot of commonalities, but I was, I was really grateful because I kind of walked into this room, all these people, <laughs> you know how that is. And maybe no one's like me, but I, like I said, I'm kind of this, like, I love watching people and learning from people. And I love like a deep conversation with one or two people. That's where I shine like coffee and getting to know someone, but the mixers and the small talk, I'm actually really nervous. I don't love that. So you made it easy. It was so fun to meet you there. And like I said, now we're friends and and I've kind of stayed in touch and and we, I was on your podcast. So um, it's been a real pleasure. Um, And this year you went to the biohacking. I wasn't able to make it, but hopefully next year I'll be back. Next year, we'll do it again. And yeah, I'm the same way. I'm the introvert that poses as an extrovert, but the small talk just absolutely kills me. And that's what a a room of strangers usually is, small talk. Exactly. It was wonderful. We got to connect, right? (laughs) I felt the same. must have been like that that energy. We're like, okay. I think so. (laughs) <laughs> and it was fun to get to know what you do. So let me introduce you. Gasser is cur- currently the president and co-founder of Innovative Medicine, a company dedicated to transforming healthcare through advanced and truly comprehensive form of personalized integrative medicine. His work in medicine has garnered the attention of top medical minds across six continents, including Nobel laureates, top CEOs, Hollywood royalty, and best-selling authors. In addition, he oversees New York Center for Innovative Medicine, Innovative Medicine, a renowned medical center that attracts patients from all over the world. Um, And I want to hear kind of where you're headed, where you're going. There's so much more I could say, but let's dive in. And I love story. Um, So I'd love to hear kind of your backstory of how you got into this world um, and, and kind of to where you're at now. Absolutely. I'll share my hero story, which kind of started at birth because I was, uh, you know, born into a medical family. My mother's a psychologist, PhD. My father's a doctor, conventionally trained uh, anesthesiologist went into pain services after that at the hospital, uh, but started getting frustrated when I was a little child. I wouldn't say frustrated, just a, a little bit disappointed with the results he was getting, meaning he was helping people, but it was kind of like he says a revolving door. He gave the drugs, he gave the epidurals, he, you know, he did surgeries and everything and they would get better and then they'd come back worse. And, you know, sooner or later, you're sort of out of options and pawned it off to the next doctor, the neurologist down the line, someone else, because it would always be these, uh, you know, different changing instances of chronic disease, how it spreads through the body, how it kind of interacts, even starting with pain, moving on from there. So it was in those late 80s when I was still a young kid that my father started to travel the world. And he started to say, what else is out there that can help my patients? What else can I put in my toolkit to really get better results and not just manage these diseases, but actually help heal people? And that's where, you know, I got to go as like a little kid to the the Great Wall of China. And I think I was at that time, it was like not too many Americans. I think it was in 92 or 93. Uh And I had long flowing blonde hair and and all the Chinese uh, young girls thought I was like a a boy bander and would take (laughs) pictures of me, run up to me. And again, I was the introverted little boy that was sitting there like shaking, like, oh my God, (laughs) stop taking pictures of me. (laughs) My mom thought it was very funny when, uh, yeah, they they mistook me for some kind of famous American. But I remember that that was a great experience. And my father was learning about acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine. He kept doing that. He kept just traveling the world. And I was blessed to go along for the ride and and learn a lot of this stuff as if it were normal. I really thought every doctor did this and all doctors, you know, learned about laser therapies and, you know, Ayurveda and shamanism, all these different things. And uh, little did I know that wasn't what most doctors did, actually, especially in conventional medicine in the United States. But uh, you know, he as he brought in his toolkit, he saw better results and he took it into a private practice and he expanded and he just started seeing some tough cases and was able to help people. 
uh, through a personalized and functional integrative approach. And, you know, after I got out of college, so I, I actually didn't follow in his footsteps as much as he wanted me to uh, and said, you should be a doctor and take I this. Did you want to kind of go into medicine? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was I was kind of, you know, set up to mm -hmm. take over his practice and keep yeah. things going. And, you know, I, I, I appreciated it, but I wanted to carve out my own niche. I wanted to do my own thing. I thought that would be in finance. That's that's what I went to school for, finance, and marketing and business. Uh, and then I got into finance and, you know, the real world and realized it is absolutely not for me. It was like yeah. right away, like my first day, I was like, wait, I'm just hitting a button over and over. Yeah. And there's like 10 lines of people ahead of me. And it's going to take forever to get to even maybe a place where I could be just a little bit creative there. Uh, and I said, no, nah, that's that's not me. I need to be free more. So I, I turned to what I knew. I knew medicine. I knew this kind of, this was different now. I realized that, that what my father was doing was ahead of its game, I thought. It was combining so many different things that were not yet even looked at in uh, conventional Western medicine. And it was getting results. That That's what really kind of brought me in. It's like, why don't more people know about this? How can I get involved from a business standpoint, work alongside my father? So it's kind of like this, this beautiful story of like, hey, I'm not a doctor, but I get to work alongside my father in the same industry and hopefully make a bigger impact with him as well, where he can spend time healing patients. We can expand this and I could help doctors from the management, administrative, operational side and everything so that they can focus on what really matters. And that is healing patients. And that's kind of where we've we've gotten to nowadays is. How do we transform medicine out of sick care to true health care and yeah. healing people and allow doctors to shine? Oh, gosh, I you're speaking my language because, again, <laughs> most doctors, as, as I well know and you well know, don't have a lot of business expertise and they want to really see the patients, especially if they're heart centered, empathetic. They're not usually it's rare. I should just say it's rare because there are some that are brilliant business people sure. and also brilliant clinicians, but it's rare to have both. <laughs> rare. It's very rare to have both. It's like that mixture of like kind of design meets functionality. Yeah. Like Apple was able to do yes. that. You're like, you're like, you know, up there, if you could do that and if you could be like a healer and a good at business, it's like, yeah. whoa, but most are one or the other. And we have to appreciate that and be able to say, do what you do best. Yes. Don't you, if you don't market your, that's fine. Don't worry yeah. about that. My father never liked getting in front of the camera or being markety or even speaking. He wanted one-on-one -on -one interactions with patients. That's what he wanted. And I said, let's give you that. And you don't need to worry about yeah. marketing. We'll take care of that. Let me take care of that. I love that. Cause again, like even for me, it's interesting because I'm sure you read years ago, rocket fuel about, you know, mm. the strategist versus the visionary. And like, when I started my practice, I had to do everything and I could at the beginning. Everyone does. And <laughs> the more I've grown and the more I do, uh, the more creative I've gotten. And like you even mentioned with finance, you use a lot of left brain. I did bioengineering mm -hmm. background. So it was just like very analytical left brain. And then as I've grown, I've really, really embraced the intuitive right brain. And I love that mm -hmm. part, but I felt like I really can't perform in the creative intuitive place if I'm stuck in the details of management or the uh, accounting or any of that. So I've oh, yeah. ever, which is probably a lot of doctors and a lot of doctors listen to this podcast too. So I think it'll resonate, which is why I'm spending a minute here. Um, really feel like they are inhibited by that management of the business. So again, thank God for people like you. So then you got into the business of, of medicine. Did you start with just your father and his clinic and then grow or how did it go to where you're at now? Yeah, you know, it was it was an interesting transition with lots of pivots. Like we started, me and my co-founder who's a doctor, uh, Dr. Mark Ivanitsky, we, we started it out as how do we get, you know, the kind of general idea of like, let's say the dispensary. Mm -hmm. How do we at least get good supplements into yeah. the hands of people? This was before Amazon was really yeah. large or anything. Wow. And it was like, how do you take those, you know, good brands that now integrative doctors know mm -hmm. And start to distribute those, at least so people have an understanding, oh, these are what doctors use. Yeah. These are the good ones. These are good nutrients, nutraceuticals, homeopathic remedies, all of them we saw. And we started that way. Um, uh, and then we pivoted. Amazon came around. Other things came mm -hmm. around there. And so we pivoted into actually educating other doctors. And that was a big one. We said, all right, how do we really leave a mark on medicine? You got to educate other doctors. Yes. And so we started doing that. We traveled the world, definitely educated people. But we also realized we weren't that in control as to their environment and everything else. So it was a lot of times it was very difficult to just have a weekend 
with a doctor teaching them all these new techniques and not actually being there to implement it. Yeah. And so many doctors did, but you know, to implement a large number of tools within your toolkit, it's, it's pretty hard actually, you know, a lot of doctors are already set in their ways. They can add one or two new things, but we were asking them to add whole new modalities they had yeah. never heard of. If you don't know about energy medicine, that takes right. some time, right? Yeah. Acupuncture yeah. isn't just, oh, I'll just buy some needles and start doing it. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, then we again pivoted and said, all right, let's go back to what we have the most control of and we could do, which are the centers. And we started, of mm -hmm. course, my father, and we expanded the one I'm sitting in now, the New York yeah. Center for Innovative Medicine. And we're at this point now looking at other centers, working with other doctors, continue to branch out and create kind of these harmonious environments for healing and play good artists who are doctors within them to expand that way and provide not just the, let's say, management side of it, but the actual environment, the space yeah. Yeah. to really conduct all this healing in. So that's what I'm excited about is to continue to do that and continue to allow more and more people access to something like this that is, you know, a unique medical approach, as you know, that works mm -hmm. so well. Oh, I love everything you've said. And one thing that two things resonate, and then I want to hear your reflection on this, because I'm just coming at the doctor perspective with one clinic, right? Um, one thing that you mentioned environment, I remember going pretty much every, every uh, clinic I've ever built, but for sure, this latest where I'm at right now, and you know, the white walls and the cubicles and all this stuff that we typically see, it actually, I think creates PTSD in patients and you clearly oh, yes. have so the aesthetics really matter. And I remember literally designing the clinic, everything in mind from the lighting to the ambiance, to the real artists that were local art to literally we have these wine glasses. They don't cost any more than a regular glass, but when someone gets a glass of water, they get their water in a wine glass. And it's something mm. magical. You see their face light up because it's me saying you're special and it's, a, it's no big deal. Right. But it's just a little tiny little detail that tells that patient walking in the door that they like, wow, it's not wine, it's water, but it's still like means something special. And, and all those kinds of details I thought through because I knew I wanted to create an experience because what happens is when a patient starts to feel welcome, unconditional love, uh, a healing environment, and just even the, the warmth from our staff, like you are so welcome here. What can we do to make you comfortable? That's where the healing starts, right? And you Absolutely. and I know this, but like, it's so critical. So I love that you talked about that. What have you noticed in your clinics that you've incorporated that have really made a difference in the healing? For the patient. Uh, honestly, everything you've said there is so spot on. It's the little things. Nothing mm -hmm. could be bigger to a patient, right? The analysis of everything from the lighting to the types of, uh, you know, plants that you have inside. You know, we really try and embrace a biophilic design with really trying to make nature as healing. Love so it. make it as natural as possible, as much natural light coming in through the windows. Of course, everything needs to be purified. We have UV, special MERV, like, you know, air purification, all the rooms and everything. Even air quality, right? That's one thing. Absolutely. Air quality, light quality, <laughs> yeah, energy, yeah. you know, crystals in certain places, Soma Vedics, which I know yeah. we were both yes. there with your A, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, you got to look at every step of it. Because honestly, if you want to heal, you have to be in the right environment. Yes. You know, we have to create the right environment within our bodies for healing, but we ourselves have to be in the right yeah. environment. So I, I never understood how hospitals could have these flickering fluorescent lights, right. chemical smells everywhere because they're using yeah. so many cleaners. Right. We only use natural cleaners here. We don't use any scents or anything. If you find anything in the bathroom, it's going to be an essential oil or something to cover an odor. It's not going to be for breeze or anything like that. Yeah. You know, you look at every angle of that, mm -hmm. the colors in each room and how they correspond to psychology, mm -hmm. the way things are positioned openness, large yes. open areas that make you feel a little bit more, you know, open, you could breathe deeper, yeah. things like that. Uh, you know, just putting on meditative music and things mm -hmm. that, you know, bring down the sympathetic response. Because of course, usually yeah. coming into a doctor, you're going to have some trepidation, some stress, some, ooh, what's going to happen? They got to put a needle inside. Right, of right. All everyone's talk. We actually did this recently, Dr. Carnahan, where I think I got this out a little bit from you. So I'll give you some credit here, but we have a post-it notes and, and on it, it talks pensions and affirmations and they could scan and learn about the science, but we asked them to write down, I am healing, or I feel great, or I love my body as it heals. And we put that on the IV bags and give it that intention that goes into that. And people really feel good. Even if they say, kind of silly. I don't really believe in this stuff. 
by the end, when they are healing, they believe in it because they start to transform and healing should be transformative. It shouldn't just be about, hey, let's get rid of your symptoms. You'll be good. That's not really healing. That's pressing symptoms. So you really want healing to be this transformative thing. So education is so important. We want them to go home and write more of those affirmations yeah. and things. So all of that is incorporated into the design. So you really got to look at what is the best environment, a sanctuary you could create that fosters healing, doesn't spike up cortisol levels, get you stressed when you walk in, isn't this sort of, you know, everyone's coming in and out, mercy room, clinic heal. It is when they come in, oh, is this a spa? Is this yeah. some kind of, you know, you want, you want them to be in a state of, I like coming here. This is where I really feel good and I can heal. And then I take these ideas and hopefully bring them home with me. Hopefully start to create your own harmonious environment right there where you sleep, where you eat, right? Because that's so important. So I, I feel like that is the, the, the blueprint for medicine in the future, regardless of what type of medicine you practice practice, you got to create the environment that helps a patient at, feel at ease and actually creates a healing response. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Response. Brilliant. And I love that you're doing that and showing other doctors how to. A couple of thoughts as you're talking. One is you said uh, transformational, totally on board with that. Love that word. And my thought was it's instead of transactional, it's transformational, right? It's like that shift from transaction to transformation. Absolutely. And I like that, that contrast. And then second, um, we know you just basically said the, the key to habits and lifestyle change and anything we want to change about ourselves. So we want to eat differently or we want to go to bed earlier. Or we want, it's all, and you know, whether it's Dave Asprey, BJ Fogg, any of our colleagues that have written about habits, 90% of it is our environment because our environmental clues gives us the habits that we uh, start to become our identity, right? So if you don't have junk in the house, that's going to be an easy habit to break because you can't, you have to go out to the store to get it, right? Um, yeah. or if you have, like for me, I have a bedtime routine and I have things kind of set up for reminders, like my Epsom salts are there by the bath. Mm. Just when you mm. make things easy to do, then there's no excuse. Or one thing I've done is instead of working out at the gym, I have like a power play and a pull-up bar. If you look at the doorway, mm. the pull-up yes. bar right there. Love and it. so I put these little habits in my house just because what I do is I no longer do a workout. I just go through my day and I'll do different things as I'm walking through my day. I sneak in workouts and it's yes. all about that environment, which is conducive to habit. So I love that you said that because I think that's whether we show people in the clinic or they teach themselves at home to do these things. A lot of it is putting those cues and making it easy so that we don't have excuses to not do the things we know we need to do, right? Absolutely. And you think about it, you only have a patient maybe a few hours a week in there to, to do that. But what about all those other hours in a week? What are they doing to continue to heal, continue to serve as their own catalyst and their healing response? And that's another big thing about this type of medicine. It isn't that the doctor is, you know, doing the healing for them. They are doing it themselves. They are just guiding them through the process of it and basically reestablishing a self-healing environment for the body sort of forgotten or it's become uh, you know overburdened in many ways but that that is our goal you know we all say we're not here to truly heal you and leave you like in a yeah. we are here to get you into a self managing and self healing state so you could keep doing this we want you out of here as quickly as possible in all yes. honesty you know and that's that's also a, a unique approach to it because it empowers the patient they're doing the work you know it's all in there to yeah. do it and I think when you do that, you, you they then also become very excited because if they have the power, then they're going to continue to create the actions afterwards that keep them in a healthy state. Anyone that's lost their health knows 
once you get it back, it is such a precious treasure. Nothing else matters when you don't have your health. And that really, uh, you know, I think educates, empowers, inspires people to take on the responsibility to heal. Mm, so true. So what have you found in your experience to be the most um, either surprising or transformative things that you've either learned or done in, in this work with doctors and creating clinics in the last decade or so? You know, one of the biggest things I, I think, even coming from a business background, is that like, you know, medicine is is a, a strange industry. You know, it really is. There's there's so many doctors I think that have good intentions, but the the whole industry is is a little bit kind of broken. I would say in many ways, you know, and and the results aren't there. It's kind of like if you went to a financial planner and you were just losing money every year, would you be okay with that? And somehow so many people are, you know, they just get a little sicker each year, another medication, they're feeling a little worse, you know, they're told it's genetics or just part of aging, but, but the quality of life just goes down usually if you're already in that cycle. And I, I found that really wild that people are, are okay with that. You know, if you lose money, people get really angry, right, right? right? They get upset, they fight over it, they'll take you to court, they will bash you. Somehow. In medicine, it's become completely okay to sort of just, you know, slowly fail in a sense, and your body gets a little worse. And we've so normalized it that, you know, knowing what I know on the other side and knowing how so many patients that finally do leave the conventional realm after not getting better and go into the functional integrative realm and get better and say, why didn't I hear about this earlier? And it kind of is like, yeah, why didn't you? And I know that there's a big business behind this. I know there's a lot of old established ways to this going back to the 1900s and the Rockefeller medicine men and all that. Yeah. Um, but still, it's it's we live in a day and age where information is all around us. You can find so many pieces of information. And again, to me, health is such is the most important thing in yeah. anyone's life. It should be, again, yeah. knowing so many people that lost it and seeing how they mm -hmm. suffer. And then, you yeah. know, that that's not real uh, living in a sense. So I found that really, really unique, interesting that this industry kind of still goes on without changing too much. And with a lot of this, just kind of, I would say comfort level to yeah. how it goes. Complacency, and right? <laughs> it's complete yeah. complacency and almost this, well, my doctor told me so, so, and yeah, I feel terrible, but it's like, why would you say, but there right, shouldn't be right. any buts in this. Right. We should all be given a chance to live healthy and happy and not be told that it's not possible when we know it's somewhat possible. You know, there have been miraculous healing events for even people that are paralyzed and can walk now. Yeah. And that's not what 90% of people with chronic disease are even going through. They're yeah. just going through a lower quality of life. So I found that really interesting because again, in business, it's always about optimizing. It's always the customer wants more and they, you know, on top of it and this and that and give them a unique experience. And here we are in conventional medicine. So many of my friends, oh yeah, they didn't even touch on diet. You know, wow. the doctor just yeah. said, take this pill. They didn't even say anything about exercise. They spent seven minutes with me and yeah. look how expensive it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I understand insurance covers it. So you don't really see all that, but insurance is expensive. You and know, if you ever problem, saw right? your medical bill, it's like, whoa, your head explodes. That's kind of part of the problem is just like our food from the earth. When we used to grow all our own food, we were associated with the soil quality and the quality of the yes. crop we grew. And we like saw from seed to stomach what was happening. And now we've become the same thing. We go to the grocery store, we get stuff that's trucked across the nation over two weeks time and all this stuff. So we, we don't any longer associate our food with actual real soils and growth and all of that. That's right. It's the same yeah. with our health and our insurance, that, that separation, which is why, like I go to direct to the consumer, I don't have insurance involved. And I do that not for me, even though it is a benefit to have less time. It's actually the patient that gets the benefit because I am 100% about what do they need? There's no middle person telling me what's right for them. And I will fight for them to the end. If I feel like some procedure or, or um, herb or medication or whatever I'm doing is right. But it sounds like you're saying that actually disconnect has d done a disservice because we've farmed out our health to the uh, insurance industry, which is not a health industry. It's a disease industry, right? It's a disease management industry. Mm -hmm. It profits as you stay diseased. And as long as you're staying alive and diseased, that, that makes them a lot of money, unfortunately, because that's a very sad prospect yeah. you would hope. But again, 
I went to business school. I understand fiduciary duty to stakeholders. That is your number one. You don't have a fiduciary duty, literally a legal obligation to your customers. Mm -hmm. You don't have that. And your indemnity is probably up there. You're making a lot of money. They know how much they'll pay out in the lawsuits and they'll still profit. So that is their duty to give that to all their shareholders. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of throws you in this, well, yes. how can a healthcare industry first put yes. profit and shareholders over sick people? But that is exactly how the business realm works in yeah. publicly owned uh, companies. So, you know, when you learn those sort of things, you say, oh, okay, that, like, that's their legal obligation. <laughs> so yeah, the dollars matter uh, most. Yeah, yeah. And they are going to preserve that anyway, because they have that legal obligation to millions of people. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a sad realization. But at the same time, it allows for opportunity to say, let's go a different route. You know, I will never bash conventional medicine. My father started there and it sounds like I may be, I'm more bashing the business side of it. I think antibiotics are incredibly useful. I think surgeries are remarkable when you have acute injuries. I think hospitals are absolutely necessary, but when it comes to conventional medicine, we need to face the facts. This is not a winning, you know, battle we're going up against with just the conventional way, but there's these, there are these amazing opportunities within functional medicine, alternative, whatever word you want to give it there that are providing great solutions. So to me, it's let's stop battling each other in medicine. I am right and saying, I, mean, I, mean, I just could not agree more because that's where it's at. And even for me as an MD, I've been trying to say, how can we talk and bridge this gap? There's nothing wrong with conventional medicine in the sense of that is there for emergency stroke, heart attack, you name it. But it's like, how can we expand the toolbox, right? And how can we think differently about- Absolutely. And if anything, how can we work with the company to say, hey guys, the, the, the trillions are nice and everything, but you could still make billions of dollars. We could still have maybe 10% or so that are ill and require some kind of medications. Of course, I'm not saying that let's ban all medications and right. big pharma. Maybe it could just be not so big pharma, right? right. <laughs> and not be always looking at profits over people in a sense. Yeah. Uh, and marketing it that way, even something as simple as every other country except New Zealand, United States, you cannot market directly to the consumer yeah. with pharmaceutical uh, with pharmaceutical drugs. And it makes sense. Yeah. You can't yeah. go out and buy that. You literally right. have to go to your doctor and twist their arm because you saw some yeah. nice commercial with people running through a field of sunflowers. Right. Like, why is that allowed? And it, I, I understand. I would never like expect it to be. And again, big pharma should be okay with that. They should say mm -hmm. everywhere else in the world, yeah, we yeah. get it. It's the doctor's choice here alongside the patient. But yeah. you can't start giving patient some kind of medical information they really don't know too much about and influence the doctors just for money. Right. Um, right. That that and then of course I think uh, expanding on the medical education system to incorporate more nutrition, lifestyle, things like that. This doesn't sound unreasonable if you just break it down, right? right learn right. everything you learn. Add in a little bit of this, that. Add in a little bit of Eastern medicine, some other things. It wouldn't be too difficult. We'd have much more well-rounded doctors coming straight out of medical school and really helping people. Yeah, I always say just that toolbox. We just need a bigger toolbox. There's nothing wrong it. with original tools. So let's um, two things I want to talk about. Yet yeah, one is um, you work with doctors, and what I've seen you know, over the pandemic, especially even before, but it's really. Um, exponentially gotten worse since then is this dissatisfaction of doctors with the system and wanting more as well. So you're probably seeing more and more docs. What are the biggest pain points you see with docs who maybe are still stuck in a conventional employee-based system and they're, you know, they're limited on time, they're doing tons of prior authorization, spending a lot of time and things they don't love. Um, so what are the biggest pain points and how can models of integrated medicine and clinics like yours actually help doctors uh, as well as patients? Yeah, I, I think it's really difficult for a doctor to even uh, visualize what it would be like to move away from where they are now. It's a very structured and regimented insurance involved bill codes, you know, it's incredibly systematic. Mm -hmm. The standard operating procedures are all there for them. And they almost feel like they need to abide by them and stepping outside would be a death warrant. That's mm -hmm. that's what they're kind of told or that's their internal belief system almost. So it's, it's very difficult to find a doctor that's willing to really take that risk of going into something they're not too sure of. 
something they were told wouldn't really work, something they were told, you know, you got to stick within the conventional realm. This is the only scientific. And Mm -hmm. we know that now that evidence-based medicine is complete on functional side, you know, medicine side, and there's so much science to it. Um, Nevertheless, I think that it really is the belief systems. You know, if you could change the belief systems and if you could have doctors just taking a leap of faith. I remember my father was first, uh, you know, thinking about opening a private practice and leaving the hospital. His colleagues thought he was crazy. They said, Tom, you're going to be out of a job soon. And I don't know how you pay for your kids. Everything, And, you know, we feel bad for you. Why are you doing this? And of course that gets in your head. You know, my dad wasn't, you know, silly or stupid. He had skepticism around a lot of this stuff, being a conventional doctor and being very logically minded. But he said, listen, there's something in my heart that says, this is where I need to go. You know, don't listen always to your head. It can be a little bit corrupt at times. You got to listen to your heart. And he took that leap of faith. He went out of the, you know, insurance game and everything, which was unheard of. Um, And he did better than ever. Yeah. You know, and patients were happier yeah. and patients started coming from all over the world, not just locally. Yeah. And they told people and he never advertised a single dollar and had always a busy practice that just grew more nurses, more practitioners, more yeah. everything. And, you know, he doesn't look back on it now at all with any regrets. Yeah. But it took a leap of faith. It took a changing of his belief system. It took a certain level of I want to do more. Um, and I can do more. And so I think that the best way to get doctors to do that is just keep doing what we are doing in this field, which is getting people better. Yeah. It's always funny when, you know, patients kind of jump back and forth between the conventional realm and then come to a you know clinic like ours or yours, get better, and then go see that doctor. What'd you do? I don't exactly. understand this. <laughs> I mean, the good oh. ones, the good ones become inquisitive. The ones yeah. that don't have too big of an ego. Yes become, I want to talk to this doctor. I got to learn more about this. The ones with an ego say, no, nah, I couldn't have been that. It's got to go back on your drug, right? And they get worse mm-hmm. almost. Um, but I think, you know, more and more having that open mind. I also think the young ones are a little bit easier. You know, when you're already a little bit older and entrenched in what you right. do, it's hard to take on something new. I understand that. So I do wish that more and more young doctors saw this as a great opportunity. And that's what I, I feel we're trying to do also. We're trying to say, hey, you just got out of medical school. Like, you know, you got a tough road ahead of you somewhat in conventional medicine, but you got a pretty good one here where you could super yeah. focus on patients, not worry about any of the red tape bureaucracy whatsoever, and keep learning because functional and integrative medicine is in- incredibly dynamic. And there's so many cha- changes happening, new therapies, new advancements that you're constantly learning and going beyond your scope of, let's say, specialty to keep learning more and more outside of that. And that's what really, I think a lot of practitioners that are in our industry and in the field of integrative functional find really rewarding. Mm -hmm. There is never enough to learn. You're not stuck within just your anesthesiology specialty or anything. It's not just about the CMEs and fulfilling. It's actually about going to cool things around the world and adding to your toolkit, which is a very rewarding feeling. And then you get to see your patients do even better. So it's kind of like this, uh, you know, reward cycle for doctors that finally do. And I do think nowadays you're seeing a lot of burnout, you know, COVID really took a hit on on conventional doctors, especially, right? But what it did from a silver lining from the patient perspective, it got them to say, I need to do more. I do have this chronic disease. You know, I never really thought about too much. I was always on this pill and always kind of feeling fatigue and everything. But COVID gave me a little bit of a scare. I am in the high risk factor. I got to do more to turn around this and actually heal myself. What can I do? Steps in, you know, functional medicine yourself, other practices. So we've we've seen more and more kind of open-minded people saying, I want to go beyond what I'm doing right now and truly heal and optimize my health. And I think that works for both sides. You know, as you have more demand of the patient, practitioners usually follow. And then if you have frustration and you have this ability to provide an environment where a practitioner could thrive, they also see that. So it's a win-win scenario, I think, looking into the future of this. I do too. I think it could, we, and we never could have predicted the COVID effect on this industry and doctors, but it really has 
opened a huge door for a need that was already there, but I think it's like blown it open, right? Oh yeah, it really has. I, I think that was, uh, you know, unintended maybe a yeah. consequence of all this, but actually a, a positive one. Yeah. Um, one of the things I love that you shared about your dad was that well, sometimes I call them watershed moments, but I remember sitting on the threshold. I was in a, I was in an integrative center, but I was employed by a hospital and it wasn't working because it was still based on productivity. Right. And at, there's this watershed moment where I literally could have moved across the country. I ended up did. I moved to Colorado and I had no, I had just savings sold our house and it was completely starting over, like you said. And it was this, I love that you share that because if there's practitioners listening, I just want to encourage you. I went for 18 months and lived on my savings. And yet mm. that decision was when maybe one of the best decisions I ever made in my life to put me to where I'm at now with the freedom um, in every way and, and an absolute love for what I do. I would never do anything different. So I loved, and your dad had a very similar story, but I kind of wanted to emphasize that watershed point. It is freaking hard. And forgive for me, I made not enough money to survive. I lived off savings for 18 months until it shifted. And, and since 2016, I've had a five-year wait list. So there's plenty of patients <laughs> like that, but all that is to say, not to say anything about me, just to say, if you're a practitioner out there and you're listening um, and you're afraid because the fear is real, um, if this is what you love, I can almost promise you it will be rewarding, but it's that threshold thing. And it's not always easy on the other side of that for the first part of it, right? Now you've created systems where doctors could probably walk right in and be much more settled than like someone starting over. But I just want to emphasize that's very real. But on the other side, the rewards are so amazingly worth it. It's so abundant. And, and it really is, you know, all the doctors that I've seen that have made that leap of faith and gone through those challenges, stepped into the fear, uh, absolutely have felt completely, you know, impassioned by it. It almost reinvigorated yes. that why they got into, you mm -hmm. know, what they do in becoming doctors and practitioners and healthcare workers, because you, you start to transform lives. And I use that word a lot because I do think medicine and a healing process is transformative. I don't think it's just take these pills, call me in the morning. That makes no transformation. That does not change a person truly on that deeper level of body, mind, spirit, whereas real healing does. And when you hear those stories from those patients, just, you know, it's such a touching moment it for is. anybody, for myself, but especially for a doctor who's there and saw the whole thing through and can now give that person a new life. And through that new life, there's new appreciation. They usually pay it forward. They start going into their own healing, you know, uh, journey as far as learning about it. They become practitioners or start funds or write books. All these amazing things trickle out of that, out of the healing process. And so, yeah, again, for any doctor listening, like the, I got to say, like, if you're feeling a little stuck, burned out, all these things, mm -hmm. I, I truly believe that looking at this field and, and trying to embrace it a little bit more and just seeing, does it resonate with you? Exactly. I think it would. And I think it gives that, that real reward of mm -hmm. helping to transform lives. Mm, I love it and love it. And I hope there's doctors listening that are kind of, because of, if I could be part of that transformation, let's shift to the last few minutes here about Please. you and what do you find your most powerful biohacks, uh, habits, health hacks, what um, for your life has been like the top three to five things that are most um, impactful for your own health and maintaining yeah, balance, right? In the midst of chaos. <laughs> yeah. There's so many ways you could take it because for, for a long time and like, you know, I post about this stuff on social media and everything. Like I'm a fan of the gadgets. I really am. I like, you know, lasers and I like pen. I'm sitting on a pen red light, you know, thing right yeah. now. And I have my infrared saunas and I've spent a ton on it. You know, I used to go to Baden Baden and I still do Baden Baden medicine week and just bring back things, right. Different uh -huh. types of, you know, lymphatic drainage tools and this and that. And, um, but I will say this, that with all those tools are wonderful. If you don't have, have the foundations, they don't mean much. If you don't have the foundation, like how you wake up to me is incredibly important. Like you said, I think uh, previously before we even got started, how we go to sleep, right? Your sleep routine. Uh, I think it's, it's, if you don't have the foundations down, nothing else matters. So really get your foundations down, how you start your day, what you put into your body, quality water good organic food, eat it slowly with gratitude, right? I don't care so much about what you eat. I care about the quality and how you eat more even. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's so important. Don't get stuck on anything. Don't feel guilty while eating ever, yes. even if it is something bad for you. Like Enjoy what, it, you're, right? not, you're <laughs> not the one to say whether it's bad or not your body is, but you saying it's bad is going to make it bad almost, right? Um, 
So I, I found like the biggest hacks to be the, the biohacks to be the ones that are the most easy to implement, mm -hmm. get into nature, yeah. you know, breathe well, meditate, drink lots of good, clean water, um, you know, go to sleep and really, and, and be grateful for all that. And then just tune into your body. Also, one of my hacks is just to go on a walk and ask myself questions, Yeah, you know, and just, how do I feel today? What could I have done better? Like, what am I happy about? How can I be happier? Keep asking those questions and you will, your body and your intuitive side, your subconscious will answer. Yes. And then just tune into it and do it and enjoy the ride. And like you, you could plug in all the extra, you know, gadgets, supplements, every, the peptides, the exosomes, like all of it are great. I have no problem with it. But if the foundation isn't there, the hacks just don't, the biohacks just don't work as well. So I always try and let people know, like, you don't go to the gym and start doing some really strange isometric movement, like just do some squats, some push-ups, some body movement at first. Like those are the great ones that really set up the foundation for then to you, like, you know, for you to look at those really unique ones that'll define the like lateral, you know, right. doors. And okay. I, I think that's the main point of it is like biohacking is wonderful, but you always need the foundation to biohack against. Brilliant. I couldn't agree more. Um, so last bit is what's the future for Casper? Are you going to keep doing clinics or what would be your like uh, vision in the next five years of, of the, the most impact that you would be able to make? Yeah, for me, like I'm really excited about expanding these clinics and getting mm -hmm. more artists and kind of building that and really uh, providing a, a wonderful space for both practitioners and patients to go to truly heal uh, and and provide this to access to more people. That That's kind of my number one priority. Uh, I'd love to write a book about all of this. I'd love to get together with my father and write a book, you know, and we both kind of calm down a little bit and get yeah. there. But those are things, you know, you got to share your story too. And everyone has stories. I know you have your wonderful book, documentary and everything. That's important to share that with others. And I think it really connects on emotional side. And I think that's one of the biggest things I'd like to do is continue to kind of um, push for medicine to rehumanize itself. To not just be diagnoses and numbers on a piece of like, you know, paper from a lab, but truly understand that at our core, we are humans and we have to look beyond that sometimes. And healing is a matter of faith. It's a matter of beliefs and thoughts and energy and spiritual things. And, and that's really, really important because as much as we could do all the IVs in the world, all everything, if you don't have the belief, you'll heal. If you don't have the proper mindset, you won't. You know, we could get you probably to a healed spot. You'll probably get sick again because of that. And so it's really important that I think medicine as a whole focuses on those things and reestablishes our humanity within us, because I feel like that's one of the most healing things we all have. Love every word of that, um, not only story, <laughs> but belief, but it's funny because a lot of people say, well, why did you think you overcame cancer and all the stuff you did? And at the core I believed I would like that's Absolutely. the core, right? Like there's, so I can have done all the other things in the right way or the wrong way, but at the core, I, I just knew right? and knowing yeah. was belief. So thank you for ending with such profound words. Thank you for all you do in the world. Love your spirit and energy, as well as all the beauty that you bring to physicians oh, and to you, your Dr. clinics. Brian. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks again. You as well. Thank you.